Okay. Well, um, I think we're going to get started. First of all, I just want to say thank you to um, folks who are joining us um, on a Monday morning, first thing, to hear um, about Crisis Group's work on U.S.-China relations. Um, I'm really delighted um, that we were able to bring this together this morning with our uh, special guest, Ali Wine, my colleague here at Crisis Group. Ali is a distinguished commentator on U.S.-China relations and is also the senior research and advocacy advisor in our U.S. program focusing on U.S.-China relations. And we're just so fortunate to have him as a colleague. Um, and he has just helped guide a Crisis Group through a report that was published recently called The Next U.S. Administration and China Policy. It's, it's available on Crisis Group's website, and it's about understanding the stakes in the upcoming U.S. presidential election for U.S.-China policy, which a lot of people, I think, would be described as the most consequential uh, bilateral relationship, U.S.-China relations, that is, um, in the world. Um, so we're very fortunate of Ali's expertise on this matter. We're really excited about the report. We hope people will have a look at it. And um, just to sort of as a teaser, we're going to talk a little bit of today about some of the principal findings and recommendations to emerge from the report. Um, so the format for today's event, um, it's a space, obviously, or an X space, I guess. And we will be uh, chatting, having a moderated conversation um, uh, for about, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes, just Ali and myself. Um, during that time, if you have questions that you'd like to pose, and forgive the siren uh, outside, but you know we live in a city and that's what, what happens. Um, but during the conversation, if you have questions that you'd like to pose uh, for a session, which will be the back half of the call, uh, please send them um, uh, to DM at Crisis Group, uh, and we will pick them up and share them with Ali. And um, we're going to go ahead and put the link to the report in the space chat so that you can see it there. Um, again, DM at Crisis Group. Um, we'll get your questions into the mix. Um, so welcome, Ali. Thank you for joining us on Monday morning. Steve, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be talking with you. Great. Well, just to sort of set the scene um, for the report, because I think it's an implicit, if not an explicit premise of the report, that in fact, um, there are stakes in the upcoming presidential election in terms of how the U.S. will approach its policy towards China. Nevertheless, the report is written against the backdrop, I think, of at least an impression that there is almost a consensus on China policy um, on both sides of the aisle, a hardening consensus among Democrats and Republicans. But I know from talking to you and from your writings that your sense is that that is maybe a little bit of an under-examined or under uh, prove thesis, and that perhaps this ostensible consensus, to the extent it exists, is pretty shallow. Is that something you can talk about a bit? I'd, I'd be delighted to. And again, Steve, a, a real a pleasure to be joining you this morning. Uh, so I, I hasten to note, since since in a little while, I'll explain why I think, as you said, that presumption of a U.S. consensus on China policy is, is shallow at best, and, and I would argue illusory. So I, I hasten to note that there is something approaching a consensus among across the ideological spectrum, that China is America's most potent strategic member. And I think that that judgment has grown more entrenched under uh, under Xi Jinping's rule in China. But once you move past that judgment about the competitive challenge that China poses to the United States, this alleged consensus, I would argue, begins to break down uh, quite quickly. And there are a number of first order fundamental questions that continue to elicit very vigorous debates. And I would just identify or, or maybe surface three of them. There's I think a very important historical question, there's an analytical question, and there's a prescriptive question. So first, the historical question, uh, as it's all, did the United States get China, quote unquote, wrong? Or did the United States get China wrong, at least until the Trump administration initiated a course correction, and then the Biden administration placed that shift on a more disciplined footing? So the prevalent narrative that you often hear is that the United States, through its so-called engage with hedge policy, it naively enabled what is now the resurgence of its principal strategic competitor. The counter argument is uh, really, it takes the form of a question, and that is, was there really an alternative course of action that the United States pursued that would have slowed indefinitely, if not ultimately forestalled, the emergence of a competitive challenge? Again, a, a debate on that historical question. Then there's an analytical question. Um, is China's overall for growing apace? Uh, is China marching steadily towards centrality within the international system? Or is China's overall power uh, peaking? Is China teetering perilously on the precipice of systemic decline, or hypothesis three, uh, is China charting something of an intermediate path? And, and given China's scale, its complexities, its contradictions, uh, depending on which data one 
adduces, which evidence one adduces, one can make a plausible case for, I think, for any of those three hypotheses. Just to put my cards on the table, I think that that third hypothesis, namely that China is charting something of an intermediate path, is, is, is closest to the mark. But nonetheless, there's a vigorous debate about China's trajectory. And then the third debate, and, and I think the most consequential one is, uh, what is it ultimately that the United States is trying to achieve vis-a-vis -vis China? And again, both within Rep the Republican Party, within the Democratic Party, and then between the parties, at the risk of sounding overly reductionist, you could distinguish between uh, the, the, the camp of winners and the camp of managers. And that is to say, there are some observers who argue that the United States is in something akin to a new Cold War, uh, a largely zero-sum contest, and that the United States uh, can't merely manage the competition, but it must indeed prevail. Uh, there are questions about what it would mean to prevail vis-a-vis -vis China, but you have the winner's camp. The United States must win decisively. And there are others who caution against uh, analogizing U.S.-China relations to a new Cold War. They argue that China is uh, far more capable than the Soviet Union ever was uh, during the Cold War, far more deeply integrated into the international system than the Soviet Union ever was, uh, far more interdependent with the United States, so on and so forth. And therefore, that the United States, uh, it can't you know, realistically think about winning, but it has to think about managing. And, and so just to, just to summarize, Steve, you know, the point that I would make, or I guess the conclusion that I, I would offer for, you know, for the consideration of, of listeners is that if we had disagreements over the prudence of America's erstwhile approach to China, if we have disagreements over the trajectory of China's power, and if we have disagreements perhaps most fundamentally over the objectives of U.S. policy toward China, then this putative consensus, it's impoverished at best, and I would argue illusory at worst. Okay, great. Thank you for that lay down. Again, to those who are just joining, welcome. Talking to Ali Wine about uh, the report he recently con uh, was the lead contributor on, the next U.S. administration and China policy, available at Crisis Group's website. Um, Ali, I, I take it that you think this lack of consensus is more than just an academic matter, that it has potential implications for how the U.S. approaches its policy with China, and that those implications map to some extent onto the choice that Americans will be making at the polls on November 5th when they elect their new new president. So bottom line is there are differences, material differences, uh, between the mindset and the potential approaches that a Trump 2.0 administration would take and a Harris administration would take. Now, I, I, you know, I, I, with the, with a very strong caveat that one doesn't really know for a variety of reasons you stretch out, um, you know, or explain very uh, well in the report. One, one can't really have the best sense of where Trump is because, because, well, it's Donald Trump and he's not all that predictable. And Harris's record, you know, while more robust than people might fully understand, is still, you know, not as well developed as as others who work have worked primarily on China or as extensively on China as, as um, um, well, as she hasn't <laughs> over the last several years. So, um, you know, you're reading tea leaves to some extent, but can you give a sense sure. of what you were able to discover as you sort of looked into this in terms of the differences between the two? Sure. And, and, and Steve, I, I think that you I think that you stipulated the, a really important caveat. And obviously, you know, for the purposes of this, this report, you know, crisis group, we did speak with a very wide variety of individuals, including some former uh, senior officials in the Trump administration and some former uh, senior officials in the Biden administration. But again, your, your caveat is very valid that I think all of us who are speculating on what a second Trump administration might do on China policy, what a Harris administration might do on China policy, I think that all of us necessarily are uh, engaged in, in some level of conjecture. But nonetheless, uh, for, the, for the purposes of the report and for the purposes of our conversation, I, I'll try to offer some uh, some some speculations that hopefully are, are somewhat informed. So first, uh, concerning the approach that the former president, uh, Donald Trump, might take, I think that there are three, three pillars or three points or three considerations that I think are most you know, salient. But the first is that the former president mainly views U.S.-China relations through the lens of trade. Uh, he seems committed to accelerating uh, economic disentanglement between uh, Washington and Beijing. And, and that trade uh, that trade-centric aperture uh, through which he views U.S.-China relations is, is a long-standing one. Uh, secondly, uh, when you look at his record during his first administration, and when you combine that record with the statements that he's made uh, to date on the campaign trail while running for re-election, that combination underscores, I think, a fundamentally transactional mindset whereby he subordinates most other objectives, whether it's strengthening U.S. alliances and partnerships in Asia, whether it's improving human rights conditions inside of China, uh, there are other considerations that one might think of, but he has a propensity to subordinate most other objectives to that of creating what he believes would be a more balanced economic relationship with Beijing. Um, 
The third and final consideration when it comes to thinking about what approach a second Trump administration might take, Steve, is, is the one to which you alluded, which is there's a level of unpredictability at work, not only because Trump himself has staked out contradictory positions over time, whether how he feels about Xi Jinping, his Chinese counterpart, uh, whether his feelings about the social media platform, TikTok. So not only because of Trump's own unpredictability, but also, I think importantly, they say that a personnel is policy. And, and when you look at some of the names who have been floated, uh, who might potentially serve in high ranking positions in a second Trump administration, uh, they themselves are not of one mind. And that is to say that the advisors who would likely help him develop and shape his China policy, uh, they have divergent views on how to characterize and manage the competitive challenge uh, that China poses. So, so those are a few considerations when it comes to the former president. Um, I'll just turn briefly to uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, and, and again, you know, stipulating the caveats, Steve, that you that you posited earlier, that we are engaged in something of an exercise in conjecture. But I think that there are some uh, points that that surface. Um, you know, first, as for you know, if if the vice president were to be elected, as for her likely approach, I do think that it would draw from her background as the child of civil rights advocates uh, and as a practicing lawyer, and it's a background that suggests an interest in, in issues of human rights and international law. Now, those issues, namely of human rights and international law, uh, they do provide ample fodder for, for bilateral frictions. At the same time, the vice president has evinced a pragmatic streak, suggesting that she would look for ways to keep bilateral relations on an even keel. Um, I think a second theme or a second consideration is continuity, namely continuity with, with the Biden administration, of which, of course, uh, Harris has been the vice president. And given that she has helped drive the administration's effort to rebalance U.S. foreign policy to Asia, despite turbulence in Europe, despite turbulence in the Middle East, you know, my suspicion is that uh, a Harris team would likely aim to build on that legacy. Uh, and, and part of that legacy, of course, was uh, has been the administration's three-pronged approach to China, the invest, align, and, and, and compete notion. Um, but thirdly, and then maybe I'll stop here, you know, Steve, as, as to you know, thinking about a Harris administration's likely approach. Um, every, every new administration wants to place its own stamp on foreign policy. Uh, and obviously, I just mentioned continuity, but if we were to have a President Harris, President Harris would want to place her own imprimatur on foreign policy. She would not want her foreign policy to be seen as a mere extension or replica of the Biden administration's approach. And so there are some areas in which I think she might contemplate you know, what you might call dial shifting um, of, of the current policy. You know, export controls is one area where I, I suspect that she might contemplate dial shifting. Um, also in terms of America's approach to countries in, in the developing world, I think that many of those countries contend that the United States views them narrowly through the lens of strategic competition with China. And I think that conscious of that impression, the damage that it can do to U.S. diplomacy, I think that a Harris administration might invest more effort in developing relationships in the developing world that revolve less around great power competition. So again, uh, very much an exercise in conjecture, but I, I think that there are some reasonably informed considerations that one can formulate, both in terms of thinking about what a second Trump administration would do on China policy and also what a Harris administration would do. Great. So, Ali, I don't want to be too reductionist here with the next question, so I'm not going to ask you. Well, I am actually going to ask you who you think <laughs> Beijing might prefer. But let's put it. Let's break it down first. What do you think that through through China's eyes, through Beijing's eyes, would be the key pros and cons of each of each choice um, that Americans will be facing? And and then what is the bottom line? Do you think in terms of their preference? Sure. So the, there's an expression that's been circulating among uh, sort of among Chinese observers when it comes to, well, initially I heard this phrase when, when the contest was between, uh, you know, Trump and Biden, but I, I've, heard, I've heard this phrase as well in the context of Trump versus Harris. And, and the phrase, you know, it roughly translates to, quote, two bowls of poison. The idea, you know, the idea, as, as I think that that phrase uh, quite evocatively conveys, is that I, I think from China's perspective, you know, China's conclusion is, that regardless of who occupies the White House come January of 2025, that strategic competition between Washington and Beijing is going to intensify. That, and there's a sense in Beijing that Washington, on a bipartisan basis, is determined to stymie Beijing's further resurgence. So from China's perspective, there isn't a sense that one, you know, one president or another would, you know, would, fundamentally, uh, would fundamentally reassess Washington's perception that Beijing is... America's principal strategic competitor would not reassess the judgment that you know, Beijing seeks to overtake Washington as the world's preeminent power. Uh, having, you know, having made those you know, statements, I think that China is concerned about Trump and Harris for different reasons. And so I, I can you know, talk about some of those reasons. Why, why is China concerned about a potential second Trump administration? I think one of the most important reasons, if not the most important reason, is 
if you look at the statements that Donald Trump has made on the campaign trail, uh, he is pledging, and I think in his longstanding, uh, his longstanding advocacy for tariffs, I think that you know, China has good reason to fear that he would follow through. Uh, Donald Trump is pledging a far more aggressive campaign of tariffs than the one that he implemented during his first administration. Uh, on the campaign trail, he has said repeatedly that he would impose a tariff of at least, uh, again, underscore at least 60 percent on exports from China. And based on the studies that I've seen, or at least the, the, the forecast that I've seen, the United States were to impose a tariff of at least 60 percent on exports from China, bilateral trade between the United States and China would essentially grind to a halt. And so if he were to follow through on that proposal, we're talking not about de-risking, we're now much more in, in you know, closer to something approximating decoupling. And so I think that China is concerned, quite concerned about the potential that a second Trump administration would follow through on a much more aggressive, much more sweeping uh, tariff agenda. And then, of course, there are concerns about you know, some of the advisors who might staff a second Trump administration. And, and perhaps we can, you know, perhaps later on in the conversation, we can get into uh, what I suspect would likely be something of a, a team of rivals dynamic that would characterize the second uh, Trump administration. But there are some you know, individuals in, uh, in, in the former president's foreign policy orbit or his national security orbit who do view the U.S.-China relationship in largely zero-sum, good versus evil, existential struggle kind of terms. Uh, and some of those advisors, I think particularly when it comes to Taiwan policy, some of those advisors have argued that the United States should dispense with its long-standing policy of dual deterrence, more colloquially known as strategic amb ambiguity, and embrace strategic clarity, which I think would really be quite provocative from Beijing's perspective. I think that when it comes to you know, concerns about uh, Vice President Harris, and if he were to be elected uh, President Harris, I think there's a sense in there's a sense in China that because uh, I think because in important respects she would build on the approach of the Biden administration the approach that the Biden administration has taken, there's a sense that she would be, I think, a more more predictable, more reliable, uh, more, I think, sophisticated uh, interlocutor. And I think she would prioritize, she would continue to prioritize high-level diplomacy as a way of, I think, mitigating strategic distrust, as a way of avoiding miscalculation. But it's precisely that same, the, the likelihood of that continuity, it's precisely that same consideration that also gives pause to interlocutors in Beijing. Because a centerpiece of the Biden-Harris administration's approach to, to China. I mentioned earlier, invest, align, and compete. And a central part of invest, align, and compete, the three-part strategy that the Biden administration has unveiled vis-a-vis -vis China, a central component has been building up alliances and partnerships in Asia, building up alliances and partnerships in Europe, and importantly, stitching together those alliances and partnerships in Europe and Asia to form what a number of high-ranking Biden officials have called a latticework of alliances and partnerships. And China recognizes that the continuation, the continued buildup of that latticework of alliances and partnerships in Asia and Europe, it does pose a significant constraint on China's competitive outlook. So I think that China is concerned for that reason. But as I, but as I said, you know, Steve, at the outset of my answer, I don't get the sense that China has evinced a, a clear preference for, for one or the other. And depending on which uh, interlocutors you interview and depending on which analyses you read, there are some who say that China on balance would prefer Trump, others who say that China on balance would prefer Harris. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to you know, pronounce one way or another on that question, but just to reiterate that China has concerns about both what a second Trump administration would mean and also what a Harris administration would mean. I, I can't believe, Ali, that you withheld this two bowls of uh, poison, break, <laughs> which would have been a really good title for the report. Yeah. The, um, OK, so actually, just to follow up on that a little bit. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, one of the big flashpoints that people worry about in the relationship is it, it concerns Taiwan and the possibility that, you know, uh, China might, or that Beijing, mainland China might decide that it's finally time to make good on its claim um, um, to, you know, to, to incorporate China, uh, Taiwan fully into, into, into greater China um, and actually it, through military means if necessary. And I guess one question I have, and maybe your answer is it would depend on how one administration or another actually proceeds with China policy. But do you have a sense of just in broad terms, the likelihood that that a Chinese invasion is something that um, one administration or the other might be facing over the course of the next four years or, or in the Harris context, I guess it could be up to eight years. And two, do you think the choice of either Harris or Trump actually might influence the likelihood of, of, of that kind of event? Sure. So, I mean, it's important to state at the outset that you can never, you can never and you should never out those catastrophic, that catastrophic scenario, namely a an attempted Chinese invasion of Taiwan. And I think for, especially in light of 
you know, very recent history or against a backdrop of very recent history, namely Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Recall that in the, in the lead up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there were many observers who, I think for understandable reasons, thought you know, Putin is actually not going to proceed. He's not going to go all the way, is he? And then, of course, as, as we know, he tragically uh, did. So we can't and we shouldn't doubt that possibility. Uh, and, and, and maybe I, I can talk a little bit you know, later about some potential uh, triggers that could actually compel Xi Jinping to decide that it's, it's now or never that he has to authorize a full-fledged uh, Chinese invasion of Taiwan. My sense right now, and, and again, one, one other point that I stipulate you know, up front is that, of course, uh, one of the principal motivations for China's military modernization in recent years has been uh, a contingency in which China would uh, invade uh, Taiwan. Uh, but having stipulated those Having stipulated those caveats, uh, I am not yet persuaded of the view that China believes that it has a, a narrowing window of opportunity in which to invade Taiwan, that it has to go for the juggler now. Um, why? For a few reasons. One, I think that China feels that the, the balance of power across the, the Taiwan Strait is continuing to grow more lopsided in, uh, in China's favor. I don't get the sense that China feels that time is against it. I think that China feels that by virtue of its, its own growing military buildup, uh, importantly, which includes a very rapidly modernizing uh, uh, nuclear arsenal, uh, a, grow, a more lopsided balance of power across the, the Strait of Taiwan. I think that China feels that the time is, is on its side. Uh, I also think that given the state of China's economy, you know, China's rate of growth is slowing down, foreign investment has been drying up. Um, if you are trying to resuscitate your economy, if you're trying to court foreign investment, uh, invading Taiwan is is not likely to to advance those objectives, and so I, I think the domestic considerations also play a role. And speaking of domestic considerations as well, um, invading Taiwan would be a very, very, very to to be to understate the case dramatically an extraordinarily high risk gamble. Look at the difficulties that Russia has had in Ukraine. Now keep in mind with Ukraine, uh, Ukraine is a territorially contiguous neighbor, and Russia has staged a principally a land invasion. Um, staging an amphibious landing and breaching uh, Taiwan's asymmetric defenses, which China would have to do, staging an amphibious landing is one of the most, if not the most, uh, complicated military maneuvers of all. Uh, and there is a very high risk that if China were to proceed, there's a very high risk that as the PLA traversed the Strait of Taiwan, that uh, PLA fighters would be intercepted, that PLA military assets would be intercepted. Uh, there's a very high risk that, uh, that something could go wrong. And one last consideration uh, that, that I would... You know, stipulate as to why I think China might be a little bit more cautious right now is uh, look at all the turbulence right now within the top echelons of the People's Liberation Army. And my interpretation, or I think at least one interpretation of that turbulence is that China right now, the Xi Jinping right now, is not sufficiently confident that the PLA has the, the level of discipline, the level of, of operational readiness that it would need to, to carry out such a sophisticated military maneuver. Um, I'm persuaded of the case that that a number of commentators have made, and in, in particular, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about two essays. Uh, one that Bonnie Glazer and Jude Blanchett published in War on the Rocks this past November, and one that uh, Jennifer Cavanaugh and Isaac Harden published in Foreign Affairs earlier this year. And and both of those sets of authors they make the case that that uh, China would prefer to quote strangle uh, or squeeze Taiwan rather than go for uh, the jugular. What is what does strangulation mean? Strangulation basically means that through a multifaceted pressure campaign. So by continuing to do more and more and more military maneuvers uh, around Taiwan's periphery, by, uh, by trying to strip Taiwan of diplomatic uh, partners, by attempting to co-opt political elites in Taiwan, but by pursuing, uh, by pursuing sort of this multifaceted pressure campaign that essentially can try and grind down, grind down Taiwan psychologically over time and get much further to de facto, if not de jure, annexing Taiwan. And I think that China's calculation, at least right now, is that pursuing that multifaceted pressure campaign or that strangulation campaign, it's relatively low cost. It's relatively low risk. Um, and as I heard from one, um, and I think it also serves Xi Jinping's objectives. I, I heard from, from one a former government official that Xi Jinping doesn't necessarily need to be the leader who won, quote unquote, Taiwan, but Xi Jinping simply can't afford to be the leader who lost Taiwan. Uh, really interesting. Um, I want to, again, welcome folks who are joining um, our Twitter space with Ali Wang talking about the crisis group report, uh, the next U.S. administration's China policy. Um, please, inviting uh, listeners, please do your questions in uh, direct message at crisis group, and we will incorporate them into the conversation as they come in. Um, Ali, since you invited the question, um, 
Can you talk a little bit about the kinds of triggers that might um, change uh, China's calculus, change Xi's calculus? So instead of this um, strangulation approach, um, you know, he starts to think that a kinetic option with all of its risks looks like it is unavoidable or more attractive. What what could trigger that 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 the U.S. might do? So there there are a few triggers. There are a few triggers that that come to mind. There there may well be others, but there are a few that I, I think readily come to mind. So the first would be uh, a decision on the part of the United. Well, actually, let's let's begin with Taiwan. Um, if Taiwan were if Taiwan were to declare either make certain moves toward or ultimately declare a formal independence, I think that a Taiwanese declaration to that effect could be a uh, could be a trigger. I think that from the American side, there are you know there are a couple of triggers. Um, if the United States were to recognize uh, recognize Taiwanese independence as a matter of formal declared policy, and and here's where I I, I want to make it. I think it's important to make the distinction between dual deterrence, more colloquially known as uh, strategic ambiguity versus strategic clarity, which is what uh, some observers increasingly advocate. Uh, strategic ambiguity, dual deterrence, the upshot, and, and I should say dual deterrence is a policy that has governed America's approach to cross-strait fictions for the past 45 years. Is it, uh, is it satisfactory to all parties? Of course not. But again, in the realm of policy, and Steve, you, you would know far better than I would, but in the realm of policy, your options are very rarely good, better, and best. You're choosing from among suboptimal options, and I, I'm I'm sympathetic to the the rationale that uh, our Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Daniel Crittenbrink, put forward in recent testimony, in which he said the dual de de uh, deterrence it's preserved a very tenuous, fragile, but nonetheless a piece that has existed across the Taiwan Strait for 45 years, and so uh, qu I think quite a quite a good record. The upshot of dual deterrence is that the United States is trying to deter China and trying to deter Taiwan, albeit in different ways. So the idea is that vis-a-vis -vis China, if China thinks we're going to go ahead and invade Taiwan, we don't know exactly what the United States is going to do, but we need to make the assumption that if we were to invade Taiwan, that the United States would respond forcefully, it would respond for as long as it would take to defend Taiwan, uh, that that consideration would induce a sense of caution in Beijing and would compel Beijing to step down vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan. If Taiwan were to contemplate moving towards or even declaring independence, and if China were to invade, then some folks in Taiwan might think, goodness, what if the United States doesn't come to our defense? And that consideration, the hope is, would induce Taiwan not to move in the direction of formal independence. And that formula of dual deterrence, again, as Assistant Secretary Crittenbrink has said, uh, has preserved peace across the Taiwan Strait. Increasingly, though, as, uh, as the Taiwan Strait becomes, or as, as cross-strait frictions become more pronounced, there are some observers who argue that dual deterrence is not keeping the peace, but it's actually making conflict more likely. And so they advocate an embrace of strategic clarity. And a centerpiece of strategic clarity would be a U.S. decision to recognize Taiwanese independence. Uh, I think that that decision could be seen as an existential provocation in, in China and could potentially induce Xi Jinping to authorize a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. And then one, you know, one final you know, potential uh, decision would be uh, if the United States uh, were to restore uh, the mutual defense treaty that it had with the Republic of China, and this is the defense treaty, the mutual defense treaty that entered into force on March uh, 3rd of 1955, and it lasted through uh, normalization, the U.S. decision to normalize relations with China. Uh, if the United States were to reinstantiate uh, that mutual defense treaty, again, Beijing might consider that decision to be an existential provocation. So there are potential, there are potential decisions either from, uh, either from, Taiwan or from the United States that could induce Xi Jinping to uh, to authorize the Chinese invasion. But I think it's important, you know, Steve, just you know, for our, our listeners and for all of us, really, uh, to you know, remind ourselves that uh, war is not inevitable. Uh, something that comes to me in, in conversations that I have, you know, when I talk to, I, I think particularly when I talk to certain folks on Capitol Hill, there's, there's a creeping sense of fatalism that uh, on account of structural frictions or structural tensions, the conflict between the United States and China is inevitable. And I've always found that proposition to be uh, odd. Uh, the structural forces uh, are the result of human decisions. And it, it follows that if human beings make decisions that give rise to structural forces, it follows that human beings can make decisions that can bend the trajectory of those structural forces or can lessen the force of those structural tensions. And so we should remember from history that the decision to initiate war is a human one. The decision to terminate war is a human one. The decision to perpetuate war is a human one. And so 
war is not inevitable. It has never been inevitable. And we must never resign ourselves to, to the conclusion that it is inevitable. Uh, I think Ali, that, can I jump in? Can I jump please. in on that? Because, it's a, because we just we got our, what, our first question here. And please, again, please. I would invite listeners to, to, to send uh, their to that crisis group. Uh, and we will um, and we will incorporate them um, sure. at crisisgroup.org. That is um, first question is, um, can the upcoming U.S. president take any measures to ease tensions with China or while well, you were sort of saying that it wasn't inevitable? But let's just make this concrete. What specific steps can the next administration um, uh, uh, take that would ease tensions? And I'll add a little degree of difficulty there. Uh, uh, steps that they could take consistent with their different worldviews. So right. you know, you're going to have to make a different pitch to a Trump administration than to a Harris administration. But if you were going to make your pitch for something that was in the character of each's general approach, what would you pitch in terms of de-escalatory or, or um, trying to diminish tensions? Sure. And I really appreciate the question in part because it's uh, it's a sort of a convenient segue back to, to the report the Crisis Group just published. But I think that what we try to do in this report, because look, we don't know who's going to win. We don't know what's going to happen on November 5th. We could have a second Trump administration come January 20th of 2025. We could have a Harris administration come January 20th of 2025. And so I think that what we try to do in this report that we just published a few days ago is to think about what are policy recommendations in the service of bilateral stability and, and therefore stability in, in the Indo-Pacific, stability in the wider world? What are steps that, regardless of who wins, what are, what are proposals that we think might have some, some purchase with, with the next U.S. administration, regardless of, of which one it is? And, and I think that there are four steps that I, I think we would commend to either a second Trump administration or incoming a Harris administration first, and, and I was I, I was speaking a little bit on this point. I think the first would be to enhance dual deterrence rather than abandon it. And again, look, dual de deterrence is it a perfect policy? No, but it, in in the realm of policy, there is there are no perfect solutions. And it, very often in, in policy, quite often, and I think actually most of the policy, you are not solving problems; you are managing conditions. And I think the dual deterrence is a very effective example of a longstanding, in this case, forty-five year policy. It has not solved the challenge of cross-strait frictions, but it has managed the condition of cross-strait frictions, uh, I think, quite uh, quite ably. And so, the first of those recommendations would be to to enhance uh, dual deterrence rather than rather than jettisoning that policy. Uh, secondly, and, and I think we see some encouraging movement on this point uh, in recent months. Uh, the second recommendation, of course, would be to deepen channels of communication between the U.S. military and its counterpart, the People's Liberation Army. Uh, the third recommendation would be to make greater use of this uh, quote unquote bat channel uh, that high level US and Chinese officials have used uh, for decades, in fact, uh, to hold essential dissident confidence. And we've seen, I, I think that the current national security advisor, uh, President Biden's national security, Jake Sullivan, uh, has made, I think, very effective use of that bat channel with his counterpart, Wang Yi. And in particular, just by way of a little bit of, of background uh, of, about how important this bat channel has been just in, in the current administration, the Biden-Harris administration, uh, it's important to remember how uh, how fraught, I mean, the relationship, of course, remains fraught, but to remember how fraught it was uh, just a couple of years ago. So we had a we had a visit to Taiwan by a former U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, after which China suspended military dialogue with the United States, and then just uh, you know very shortly thereafter, we had a balloon gate in which there was a sighting of what is believed to be a Chinese surveillance balloon across U.S. territory. And in the aftermath of the incident, or with the fallout from that incident, uh, the Secretary of State Antony Blinken canceled his visit. China. And there was a period in, in late 2022, early 2023, when, when there was real concern that the U.S.-China relationship was headed into an unpredictably escalatory spiral. And so uh, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, uh, in light or against that backdrop, I think that he made a very effective use of that back channel with his counterpart, Wang Yi. They had a couple of meetings, one of them in Vienna, one of them in Malta. And those two meetings, uh, leveraging the back channel, they facilitated the meeting, of course, between President Biden and President Xi in San Francisco this past November. And, and I think that the effect of that meeting between President Biden and President Xi, obviously it hasn't fundamentally reset the US-China relationship. And I think it would have been unreasonable to have that expectation of the meeting, but it has allowed the intensification of strategic competition between the United States and China to occur in a more predictable manner. It has given rise to, I think, a much richer set of uh, conversations between high level US and Chinese. So again, just to underscore that third recommendation that whether it's a whether it's a second Trump administration, whether it's a Harris administration, but they, they should both make greater use of that bat channel. Uh, the fourth and final recommendation would be, and, and here I'm, I'm circling back to a conversation, Steve, that we were having earlier about 
whether it should be the objective of U.S. foreign policy to win uh, the competition with China or to manage it. Uh, you know, my own view is that it's important for the United States to avoid intimations that it seeks to achieve a Cold War style defeat of China. Um, as it is, China's views of America's strategic intentions have already been considerably uh, in recent years. And as I said earlier at the outset of our call, there is, I, I think, a conviction, a very deeply entrenched conviction in Beijing that the United States, whether a Republican administration, whether a Democratic administration, but the United States seeks to stymie China's further resurgence. If the United States were to intimate in a more public way that it did seek a Cold War style defeat of China, I think that that intimation would be seen, understandably, as an existential challenge in Beijing and could turn what is now a manageable competition into an existential rivalry to be avoided at all costs. So, so those are, I, I think, four four recommendations. And I'll stop just by emphasizing that I, I would hope that these are four recommendations uh, that really would hold purchase regardless of who occupies the Oval Office come January of 2025. So actually, that's well into the next question that's come in, um, which I'll paraphrase is as what keeps you up at night? So as you look at the landscape <laughs> um, in sure. you know, one or the other administration, what, it, what is it that worries you? Um, let's start with on the U.S. side. What is it? Wor- what worries you in terms of the the team of rivals you described on the Trump side or what you know of Harris and her advisors, that they, a step that they might be inclined to take that would be a wrong step and that would really change the risk dynamics in a negative way. Sure. So on the on the Trump on the Trump side, and and if, if you look at the, you know, for folks who are on the call, if you if you read the report, you'll see that we've we've tried to we've tried to flesh out some of these we've tried to flesh out some of these divisions within Trump's camp and, and in, in some detail. Um, so I, I would say on the Trump side, I, I worry about some, you know, some high level officials who served in a first Trump administration who might well come back in a second Trump administration who, who do tend to view the US-China relationship in this uh, quite starkly good versus evil, zero sum, high logical uh, sense. And um, if, you view, if you view competition in those terms, if it is indeed a zero sum contest, if uh, if China is an implacable adversary, then that judgment does lend you to argue that the United States must win, that mere management of this contentious relationship will not suffice, but that the United States must indeed win. Um, I do worry about the potential for that view to uh, to gain purchase in a second Trump administration, uh, and I worry about the potential that if, it, if that view were to gain purchase in a second Trump administration, that it could really, again, convince, uh, it, it could really introduce a much more escalatory uh, dynamic into the U.S., you know, China relationship. Uh, having, you know, having made that point, I'm not convinced, one, that all of Trump's uh, former advisors, present advisors, likely advisors in a second Trump administration, I'm certainly not convinced that all of his, uh, all of the individuals who have his ear uh, share that view. Uh, there are some, uh, si- some high level of officials in his orbit, former officials in his orbit, um, who believe that a competition is to be managed that competition is not fundamentally ideological in nature, but it's more a function of this balance of power dynamics. Um, and there's a sense that, again, this competition can be managed. And, and as, for the former, as for the former president, um, whether you look at his actions and statements during his first uh, term, whether you, look at the action, whether you look at the statements that he has made on the campaign trail, I don't think that the former president himself is uh, convinced that the United States and China are in a zero-sum contest. I don't think that he shares the view that Xi Jinping has imperialistic pretensions. And in fact, uh, I think that to the dismay of of some observers, uh, both here in the United States, but also I think in in allied and partner countries, uh, the former president uh, touts his friendship, his alleged friendship with Xi Jinping quite often. And I think that he feels that, he again, he views the the U.S.-China relationship, I think, narrowly through trade terms. And I think that his hope would be, based on what I've, I've read and heard, I think his hope would be that through some kind of negotiation, he might be able to strike a grand bargain with Xi Jinping, uh, create a less imbalanced economic relationship, and that if he were able to do so, I don't think that he would be too, too worried about other aspects of the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, so, but again, so my, my worry on the Trump side would be if, if the view, this kind of zero-sum existential struggle view were to gain purchase, I, I think it could inject some escalatory dynamics. I mentioned earlier that there are some within his orbit who advocate the embrace of strategic clarity, which I think could be seen as quite provocative in China. Um, On the Harris camp, you know, candidly, I I think I don't really have any, uh, there aren't sort of any immediate, for me, sources of concern. If we were to have, 
if we were to have a Harris administration, of course, the U.S.-China relationship would continue to grow more contentious. But as I said, there would be broad elements of continuity uh, between uh, a Biden administration and a Harris administration. I do think that a Harris administration would be committed to sustaining and expanding the remit of high-level diplomacy to make competition more uh, predictable. I think that also on account of the vice president's own uh, personal uh, upbringing, uh, you know, given, you know, given her, who her parents are, I think that the vice president would also be more inclined to, uh, to think about ways in which to prevent uh, strategic competition between the United States and China from spilling over into societal disengagement. Uh, and then and lastly, I, I think we, ha- we haven't talked about him yet, but I, I think it's important to talk about the vice president's running mate, uh, Governor Tim Walls of Minnesota. Uh, Governor Walls, because of his own longstanding interest in and experience with China, I think that he would also reinforce uh, a President uh, Harris's ethnic orientation to think about a balance of values inflected, competitive and cooperative policies vis-a-vis China. So, so I, I think that, again, with the Harris administration, I don't see sort of immediate causes for concern. Yes, the competition will grow more intense, as one would expect, but I think that you would be committed to balancing competitive policies with cooperative undertakings. That's great, Ali. And I think we're getting to the end of our questions and um, also getting to the end of our hours. So I think I'm going to close out with one last just sure. sort of open-ended question to see if there are any reflections um, on U.S.-China dynamics that we haven't touched on in this back and forth that you'd want to surface uh, in this conversation. Sure. Th- thanks, Stephen. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed the really enjoyed the conversation and, and appreciate your taking the time and, and, and to folks who sent in questions. Thank you for, for those questions. I guess maybe just two two thoughts in closing, Steve. You know, the, the first, uh, just to underscore a point that I made at the outset of our conversation, is I, I do want to stress that you know, contrary to this uh, prevalent, if not almost axiomatic narrative in Washington, that there is a, a U.S. consensus, quote unquote, on China policy. Um, if you just look at the contrast between how a second Trump administration and a Harris administration respectively would likely approach China policy, that contrast alone, I think, goes a long way to dispelling this presumption of a U.S. presumption of, or, or the presumption of a U.S. consensus on China policy. And so I would like to see going forward, regardless of who occupies the Oval Office come January of 2025, uh, I would like policymakers, lawmakers, members of the analytical community, I, I would hope that rather than insisting on the existence of this consensus, that they actually surface more vigorously and more thoroughly some of these disagreements and debates that, that we've discussed in our conversation, and, and hopefully they can expand the conversation rather than insisting on this consensus. So that would be point number one. Um, and I, I think the second point that I would make is just a commentary on the state of discourse in the United States when it comes to assessing China's trajectory. And, and Steve, you and I have often had this conversation that there's a certain, almost you could say, analytical schizophrenia when it comes to talking about China. There are some observers who seem to think that China is on something akin to a glide path towards global dominance. They they tend to, I, I think, aggrandize China beyond what is warranted. And I think that that view, it induces unwarranted anxiety among U.S. policymakers. And I think it also discounts China's a myriad competitive liabilities at home and abroad. And then on the flip side, I think that we also in the United States need to guard against uh, understating China's uh, competitive potential. Uh, China has significant uh, competitive strengths. I don't see any evidence that China is staring down a terminal decline. And so I would just close by saying that effective policy, cool-headed policy, sustainable policy, of course, is predicated on uh, even keel analysis. And so rather than rather than assessing that China is headed toward global dominance, rather than believing that it's staring down terminal decline, I think that U.S. policy towards China would be on, on a firmer footing uh, if the United States were to understand China as a competitor that is likely to endure over the long term on account of its competitive strengths, but that is going to be a constrained competitor on account of its competitive liabilities at home and abroad. So an enduring competitor, uh, but a constrained competitor uh, that should not overwhelm our capacity for affirmative, durable, prudent foreign policy. That's great, Ali. I really appreciate it. I think those are wise words about keeping um, an even analytic keel and not allowing strategic anxiety to get the better of uh of policy in this very consequential space. And I really have to thank you because I think you do as much as anybody uh, to sort of help tease out those analytic uh, fine points and broaden the conversation uh, beyond well, thank you. Uh, the realm of conventional wisdom. So really grateful um, to have you as a colleague for this conversation and for your contributions to the excellent report. Uh, again, the name of the report is the next U.S. administration in China policy. 
It's available on Crisis Group's website. Thanks to you. Thanks to all who joined us for this conversation. It was a real pleasure uh, to be able to participate in it. And we hope you will follow Ali's work and the rest of the Crisis Group's team's work on U.S. and China foreign policy into the future. Thanks so very much. Thank you so much, Steve. Much appreciated. Yep.
uh, fine points and broaden the conversation uh, beyond well, thank you. Uh, the realm of conventional wisdom. So, I'm so really grateful um, to have you as a colleague for this conversation and for your contributions to the excellent report. Uh, again, the name of the report is The Next U.S. Administration in China Policy. It's available on Crisis Group's website. Thanks to you. Thanks to all who joined us for this conversation. It was a real pleasure uh, to be able to participate in it. And we hope you will follow uh, Lee's work and the rest of the Crisis Group's team's work on U.S. and China foreign policy into the future. Thanks so very much. Thank you so much, Steve. Much appreciated. Yep.